you had already referred to the title uh, of my lecture, Closing the Doors. And I would like <coughs> first to say a few words about the title of my presentation. Uh, of course, the first meaning of Closing the Doors uh, is that people are responsible people close the door when they leave their house. That's the obvious, obvious meaning. There is a, there is a more hidden uh, meaning in this title, and that is it is a reference to a not so very well known, but in my view, classical book by Ron Clark, uh, which is called Closing the Exits. And this is a, a book about a study that Ron Clark did together with Pat Mayhew in, uh, in England, and they repeated it in the, in the Netherlands, where they showed that when the composition of the gas in the households was changed in such a way that you no longer could commit suicide uh, with the gas, that the suicide rates in England and also in the Netherlands dropped immediately after that change, uh, and that there was only very partial displacement to suicide by other means. Uh, I see this as a very convincing example of the potential st uh, explanatory strength of opportunity theory. If, you, if, if uh, extremely e extreme kinds of behavior as suicide can be so easily influenced by changing uh, some elements in the environment, in this, in this case the composition of gas, then I think it's not so far-fetched to assume that we can also change much more opportunistic, less serious types of behavior such as juvenile delinquency by changing the environment. So the title of my lecture is a, in a way, uh, uh, a, a friendly gesture of acknowledgement to, uh, to my friend Ron Clark, who, who is, I think, the founding father uh, of criminal opportunity theory. Uh, thirdly, I use this title also because uh, uh, Part of this lecture was used uh, as, as my valedictory lecture at Tilburg University, so I was also closing the doors, in a way, of my career. Uh, not quite, uh, but nevertheless. So there are some meanings uh, attached to this title. Let me now talk about uh, the ICVS, the International Crime Victim Survey. Uh, it is already quite a few years ago that I uh, formally launched the idea to set up such a survey in, at a meeting of the Council of Europe in Barcelona. Uh, and this, this, this resulted eventually in the first round of the survey in 1989. So that was a long time ago. Also, uh, the Max Planck Institute at that time was one of my partners. So Germany did take part in the first round uh, of the survey. Uh, we have uh, repeated the survey uh, five times in five major sweeps. And as I said this morning, uh, to impress the audience a little bit, we have interviewed uh, over 400,000 respondents. Uh, so we have bothered uh, half a million people almost with our questionnaire. Uh, and we did this in, uh, I think, altogether now 80, 84 different countries across the world. The, the key results of the of the ICVS are, of course, the so-called, what the, the British uh, call the, the leak tables uh, of crime. Ah, let me first show you the, the very nice <laughs> saying that, that, uh, that is very common in the Spanish language, which I also found in the German version. Offene Tür verführt einen Heiligen, or in English, an open door may tempt even a saint. And this, of course, is a, is a interesting uh, saying for the purpose of my presentation. This is this, the, the famous league table. Uh, this is uh, <coughs> a sure way not to become popular in Colombia and Zimbabwe if you publish such league tables. At one point in time, also the Netherlands was fairly high. Uh, that these were very difficult years for me uh, because it received a lot of criticism. I, I think this table gives you an interesting insight in the levels of crime across the world. You can see that some developing countries, as you probably had expected, are at the top, Colombia, Zimbabwe. Uh, but you see that in the, in the middle range, the 15 countries with medium-high rates, we, we, we also notice uh, the United Kingdom uh, and also the Netherlands. 
So it's certainly not true that, that crime is, is, is exclusively a problem for very poor developing countries. Some of the most affluent, uh, highly urbanized, modern countries like the UK uh, and the Netherlands are also struggling with fairly high levels of crime. So my conclusion is we cannot make any sweeping generalizations about the root causes of crime. It is apparently a much more complex uh, issue. We have, uh, I have compared, in order to make the point that we need victimization surveys, I have compared the level of crime according to my surveys with the level of crime according to the statistics collected by, by the United Nations and Interpol. These are the official crime figures. Uh, and they, of course, are based on the numbers of crimes recorded by police forces in, in the various countries. So here I have put together uh, uh, the, 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 the level of crime according to the police uh, statistics. That is the, uh, uh, well, what is it, gray column? And the yellow column uh, is the percentage of the public victimized by any crime in the course of the, of the past year. Uh, now, we will not discuss the details, but let's first look at the uh, level of crime according to the official crime figures of Interpol. Then we see immediately that uh, Sweden is a country to be avoided. This is by far the most dangerous uh, country. Also, the UK, uh, Finland and the Netherlands uh, really stand out with a very high level of common criminality. Uh, if you want to go to a safe place you, uh, for your holidays, you much rather go to Albania. Uh, it's almost crime-free, Albania. Uh, and the good thing about Albania is that it's, it's even going down also in Albania over the past years. Uh, so this is the, the picture of the level of crime according to the official Interpol statistics. Now, when we look at the results of, uh, of our victimization surveys, the yellow columns, you get a totally different picture. You see that some of the uh, Colombia, Swaziland, Estonia, South Africa uh, are at the top, and that actually uh, the level of crime in countries like Sweden and, and the UK is, uh, is, is, is even below the average. Uh, so the conclusion for me is, seems to be inescapable. If you want to know something about the level of crime across countries, please do not consult the official crime statistics of Interpol or the, or the United Nations, or Eurostat, who also now has started to publish these kind of uh, official crime figures. I have really come to the, to the conclusion that it would be better uh, if all these organizations completely discontinued publishing such statistics because they are nothing but a source of misinformation. And I must say, to his credit, uh, the new director of Interpol has uh, followed suit because he has taken off the public website uh, the famous uh, official crime statistics of Interpol. You will no longer be able to find them. Unfortunately, there are other organizations who continue uh, with spreading this, this uh, disinformation. Well, we have, of course, the, the, the purpose of a victimization survey uh, from an academic perspective is not just to produce these, these leak tables. That, that is important for policy planning uh, and for the political debate about crime. But, of course, from an academic perspective, we want to use these data to understand the causes of crime. Uh, and we also want to understand the, the causes of trends in crime. Uh, so over the years, we have used the ICBS results uh, to carry out, first of all, cross-sectional analysis, where we compare the levels of crime and try to see whether there are correlations between these differences and the differences in, in characteristics of these various countries. One of the first, and, and still one of my favorite analysis, is between the, 
the ownership rates of, of cars and the ownership rates of bicycles and the level of car crime, car related crime or bicycle theft. Uh, and these, these uh, correlations are almost perfect. They are very, very strong. And none of you will be surprised that my own country uh, is the world leader in bicycle theft together with China. Uh, and that a very car oriented society like the USA, but also Australia, uh, are leading the league table in, uh, in, in car theft and, 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 and joyriding. Another golden oldie in, in criminology is the relationship between uh, alcohol consumption and levels of violent crime. Using the, uh, using the ICVS data, we have shown there is a, a moderately strong correlation between the levels of beer consumption in countries and the levels of victimization by assaults and threats in countries. And obviously, Northern Europe uh, and Australia, uh, is the, these are the countries where you find the highest level of beer consumption and also by far the highest level of victimization by, uh, by assaults and, and threats in the, in, in the public domain. Uh, and this is the kind of uh, analysis that I've repeated several times over the past two decades and it always comes out very, very clearly. But that correlation, I think, is not in doubt. A more recent uh, cross-sectional analysis that I did and that I would like to show uh, you today uh, is about the level of gun ownership and the levels of serious uh, victimization by, by serious types of crime. This is, of course, a very topical uh, analysis uh, in, in view of the fact that in the United States, the Senate has just, again, uh, refused to uh, adopt uh, more responsible legislation on gun control. Uh, over the past w uh, weeks and months, uh, we, have, uh, we, have, we have been exposed to, a, to a, a very fierce debate again in the United States about this issue. And I have used the ICVS uh, data to, uh, to look into this relationship between gun ownership and victimization by serious crime. The ICVS uh, data set is extremely interesting for this purpose because we have, we ask in the questionnaire uh, a question about uh, gun ownership in the household. Uh, in countries where uh, gun ownership is, is, uh, is illegal, uh, there are hardly any reliable statistics on the level of gun ownership, but in the ICVS we have this question, so we can use our own data about the levels of, uh, of gun ownership of households. And these we have then correlated against the levels of victimization by uh, so-called uh, contact crimes with a gun. So this could be assaults with a gun, robberies with a gun, or sexual crimes with a gun. Uh, well, you see immediately that both uh, victimization by the contact crimes with a, with a gun or by just assault and threat only is uh, m moderately strongly correlated uh, to, to, uh, to these levels of violent crime. And as you can expect, there are no correlations between handguns and property crimes, or there are also hardly any correlation between the uh, rifles, long guns, and victimization. This is exactly what you would expect uh, if the hypothesis is that gun ownership uh, drives up levels of uh, serious violence. And I think our data fully confirm that uh, hypothesis. We also carried out an other analysis, and this was an analysis at individual level. Because this shows that in, in countries where there is a high level of gun ownership, you can expect more uh, higher levels of violence. But it's also interesting to know whether an individual who owns uh, a gun uh, is more at risk or actually reduces its own personal risk to be victimized by violent crime. This is, this is particularly interesting in the United States because a, a, a bestseller of some years ago by an economist, uh, John Lott, uh, he, he claimed in his book called More Guns, Less Crime, that people who own a gun can better defend themselves and deter potential attackers and that it makes you a safer household if you own a gun or a, a safer individual. This is why I carried out also an analysis at the individual level. This shows the, uh, 
I will not go into the technicalities of the analysis, but th so this is an analysis at the level of individuals, and you can, you can see that the individuals who own, uh, who own guns uh, have higher, uh, higher risks to be victimized than people who do not own a gun. And this relationship is the strongest in countries where, on average, the levels of gun ownership are rather low. There you see a huge difference between the base and the victimization risk of the owners. In countries where, such as the US, where level of ownership is much higher, the difference at individual level is more reduced. And this is probably because an individual who owns a gun in a typical low gun country like, like Germany or the Netherlands is a bit atypical and, and might even be a member of a gang. And that, of course, increases his risks. But also in John Lott's own country, uh, it's still true that uh, the ownership of a gun does not offer protection. On the contrary, it enhances your risks to be victimized by a violent crime. So the title, More Guns, Less Crime, is wrong at the macro level, and it is also wrong at the individual level. So far for John Lott. Uh, as I said in the beginning, uh, the survey uh, was carried out now five times, uh, repeated five times. So we, can, we, we are now at the stage that we can not only carry out cross-sectional analysis, comparing countries at a, in a, at a given moment, but we can also now start to analyze trends in crime over time. And that, is, that of course, uh, makes it possible to test hypotheses about the determinants of levels of crime also in, in, with time series analysis. And that is often a stronger type of analysis than just the cross-sectional analysis that I just talked about. Now, first, let's look at the, uh, at the trends in crime according to, uh, to our surveys. It is clear, according to our surveys, that uh, crime has gone down in the USA right, uh, after the first time that we did the survey in, in uh, 1998. Uh, 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 you see that every time we repeated the survey, the level of crime uh, was lower. In Europe, the columns at the right, you see that the first uh, two repeats of the survey, the levels of crime were still going up, and then they started to fall. So you could say that the drop in crime in Europe was a little bit delayed compared to the, the drop in crime in the United States. But nevertheless, the conclusion uh, uh, can be that the levels of crime are declining uh, across the industrialized world. And it is most certainly not uh, a unique uh, American phenomenon. Uh, Bloomstein, uh, also Stockholm Prize winner, by the way, uh, Bloomstein wrote, 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 a, uh, wrote a book about the drop of crime uh, and, and uh, that was exclusively focused on American statistics. He, 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 didn't, uh, he doesn't mention in his book any kind of uh, development elsewhere in the world. So it is a, it's a completely uh, country-focused country analysis. And he comes forward with, uh, with some, some uh, hypothesis. Uh, according to Bloomstein, uh, the US falls can be explained uh, as resulting from a, 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 a set of different factors. So he, he, he's, his, his approach is a little bit eclectic. He says, first of all, uh, massive incarceration has had an impact on the levels of crime. Uh, second factor, the ending of the crack cocaine epidemic uh, has, has, according to uh, Bloomstein, been extremely important in driving down levels of violent crime. Uh, then he uh, refers to this famous uh, Comstat uh, program, the use of computerized crime data uh, by the police, uh, which, which 
as you probably all know, started in New York and was later taken over by Chicago and other, other cities. So the use of computerized data about crime in the city uh, is also, according to Blumstein, an important factor. And then, finally, he mentions uh, so the famous zero-tolerance policing policies also of Giuliani in, uh, in New York. Uh, then there is this, 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 this uh, best-selling uh, uh, economist, Levitt. He came up, and you probably have heard about this, with a very imaginative explanation for the drop in crime. Uh, and he, he says that violent crime was reduced uh, by the legalization of abortion in 1976, which uh, supposedly has reduced the cohort of unwanted young males, unwanted by their, by their mothers. Uh, and according to him, this is the, the, the fifth important uh, driver of the crime falls, uh, uh, according to his uh, best-selling book. Now, we have just seen uh, that the, the crime curve, as I call it, the, the drop in crime over the past 10 years, is not a specific American phenomenon. It's, it's near universal. And that means that if we were looking for an explanation, uh, we cannot limit ourselves to country-specific factors. But we need to find factors that, that, uh, that have operated also universally. And then you immediately come to the conclusion that the factors uh, mentioned by Blumstein, uh, are, 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 they are not winners if you want to explain the international drop in crime. Uh, so in most European nations, and in Canada and Australia, the, the prisoners' rates have never reached the level uh, as that of the United States, as you all know. The, level, the, level, the prisoners' rates in the United States are 10 times higher than they are in Germany. So the, the massive incarceration, which uh, supposedly has driven down levels of crime in the US, simply do not apply here. We even have countries such as Finland and France, up to a point, where the prisoners' rates have not gone up at all over the past uh, two decades. So it's very unlikely that this factor can really explain the drops in crime in, in Europe, particularly not in Finland or in France or, 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 or in Italy. Well, we can be very brief about the crack, cone, the crack cocaine epidemic. I don't know about Germany, but in the Netherlands there never was a crack cocaine epidemic. So the ending of the crack cocaine epidemic can never be an explanatory factor for the drop of crime in the Netherlands. And I think this is true for most European countries. Well, Comstat policing was never practiced, to my knowledge, in, in, uh, in Europe, and uh, zero tolerance policing has become a very popular slogan for some uh, politicians, but I don't think it has really ever been seriously implemented uh, in Europe either, or in, or in Canada or in Australia. So there is not much left on the list apart from uh, Levitt's idea that ab uh, abortion should get the free abortion should get the credit, but if you look at the history of abortion legislation across the world, you will immediately see that the, the timing shows enormous, uh, an enormous range. In, in some countries, like my own country, abortion was already liberalized much earlier than in the USA, and in other countries like Poland or Romania or Portugal, it has never been liberalized. And nevertheless, all these countries show the same drops in crime, also in serious crime. So again, it's not from a global perspective, uh, these American uh, explanations are not very convincing. Now, I have uh, shown you, particularly uh, with, 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 the, with the results of my analysis of the relationship between gun ownership and levels of violence, uh, and my older work on the associations between rates of ownerships of cars and, and bicycles and levels of vehicle theft, that the, the, level, the, the differences in the level of crime across countries can indeed, up to, uh, up to a point, be very well explained with criminal opportunity theory. If there are more cars, there are more car thefts. If there are more bicycles, there are more bicycle thefts. Uh, now, can we also use criminal opportunity theory? And that's now the big challenge for an, uh, a proponent of criminal opportunity like me, can we also explain the falls in crime, the universal drops in crime with, 
within the framework of criminal opportunity theory. And, and I think indeed that, that we can. And the next picture that I will show you uh, sums up the dynamics of crime epidemics as I see them. I think when, when a country, for, for instance in Europe and in the US after the Second World War, we, we, uh, we had the, the Wirtschaftswunder in Germany, the, the economic booms, that creates many more opportunities for crime. There are, there are more cars around, more other uh, stealable goods, and then the levels of crime go up. So this has happened between 1960 and 1995. But then the public, of course, doesn't sit idle. They perceive the increased risks to be victimized, and they become concerned about their own safety. Uh, and that, that there is very uh, clear evidence that indeed in countries where there is more crime, people are more aware of the risks. The next step in the dynamics is that then they start to invest in self-protection. They, they may start to vote for parties that promise better criminal policies, but apart from that, they also start to take, to become responsible for their own safety. They start to step up their investments in crime prevention, for instance, household security, car security. Uh, and then, that's the final step in my model. That means that the opportunities to commit crimes will be restricted. So we have come uh, full circle. And that, if this is true, then this would indeed uh, explain why in all these Western countries we see this curvilinear uh, trend in the levels of crime. It went up for two, three decades, and now it has been going down for already more than a decade, almost universally. Uh, this is, this is uh, much older work that I did. I presented this uh, almost 20 years ago in Strasbourg at a, at a conference about crime and the economy. Uh, it is based on an analysis, again, of ICVS data, older ICVS data. It's not about trend data. At that time, we didn't have enough trend data yet. Uh, I will not explain, again, the, the, the technical aspects, is this the aspect of this, but uh, the, the core of the model is that when burglary in, a, in the European regions, because I use not countries here, but regions, uh, the NUTS 2 regions, so I have about 114 in Europe, in the regions where there are more burglaries, there is more fear of burglary among the public, because that is, that is an item in the questionnaire. And then you see that also the level of burglar alarms, possession of burglar alarms is higher. So there is a this is, of course, a part of my dynamic model. Uh, and it, it, there is some evidence for that. You can also see that the level of burglar alarms is not only driven by level of burglaries, but also more affluent countries, uh, households in more affluent countries can afford to, to purchase burglar alarms. So that is an independent factor in the model. And then we also see that where there are more detached houses and where people live in more urbanized cities, that also drives up burglary and also fear. Now this uh, statistical model, uh, so-called path analysis, uh, only explains the first steps of my model. It, 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 it provides evidence that indeed, uh, if the crime level goes up, the fear of burglary goes up, and then they start, people start to invest in burglary. It does not yet, of course, really prove the last steps that this uh, drives down the levels of burglary. For that, I, you need longitudinal data, which I didn't have at that time, but now we have. Uh, let me see where we are. Uh, now you could ask if this is all true. Uh, I, haven't, I haven't yet presented the evidence for this, but I did a little bit in the morning already. If this, is, if this is true and it is so obvious and it derives from criminal opportunity theory, uh, has anyone predicted the drop in crime? Because that, you're, it, it's much stronger for a scientist to uh, to predict the future than, than to analyze uh, what has happened in the past. 
Uh, and I must say the weakness of the explanations of Bloomstein uh, is that they are all post hoc. Bloomstein has never predicted any fall in crime whatsoever, anywhere in his work. Uh, but when the fall was there, he started to explain. It's much stronger if you, on the basis of a theoretical frame, predict that crime is going to drop. And this is actually what I did in the festschrift for my predecessor and friend, Wouter Buchhausen, Dutch criminologist, in 1994. You know, if you publish in a, in a festschrift, no one notices. It's not like in a peer-reviewed journal. So you can really write what you want. Uh, and that's what I did. So I wrote in 1994 that opportunistic criminality in the 21st century would, and I now quote, no longer be a mass phenomenon due to more and better situational prevention. So that was long before the crime has actually, had actually started to drop. Uh, the levels of crime were still increasing. In a similar vein, uh, my friend, the British criminologist Ken Peace, predicted three years later in 1997, when crime was also still going up, certainly in the UK, he predicted falls in what he called amateur thefts. He predicted a bifurcation of future offending into either clever e-fraud or predatory uh, street crime. Uh, but he, he predicted that amateur thefts would be a problem of the past. So again, a, a prediction based on a theoretical uh, position. In, uh, at a meeting of the European Society of Criminology some years ago, Ron Clark uh, again summed up the arguments for, uh, from, from uh, situational crime prevention theory, uh, and also he said that he said it is more than probable that the enormous rise in private security, uh, not just private security officers, but all, in all our buildings, offices, uh, stadiums, everywhere nowadays, you find inbuilt security, which is a huge difference with, with 30 years ago or 40 years ago when there was hardly any uh, security in, in, Western, in Western countries. Uh, so he, he gave an overview of all the different domains in life where private security had gone up. The universality and the pervasiveness of the security response across industrialized countries uh, and thereby its potential impact on levels of crime, I think, cannot reasonably be disputed. It seems very plausible. Uh, and what is also interesting is that this is indeed a universal trend. Criminal policies uh, show enormous variation across countries. The US have different traditions of punitiveness than we have in Europe. Uh, the, the, the police is, is, is a quite different organization in France and Italy than it is in, in the Scandinavian countries. We have an enormous variation in criminal policies. But in, in private protection, in private security, we, we, all, we, we see the same trends everywhere. In all, in all Western countries, you see that around 1980, it, it started a bit earlier in the US than in, in Europe, private security started booming. And also people who sell uh, technical security equipment uh, have, be, have become uh, very, very rich indeed. And that is not limited to just some countries, it is, it is universal. And also, it started roughly at the same time and that is why I think that the boom in private security is indeed a promising contender as explanatory factor of the international falls in crime at the end of the last century. But still, where is the proof? Where is the evidence? Uh, there, is, there is, I think, convincing evidence. I will not go into the details of that, but some of you will probably be familiar with that work. There is a lot of empirical evidence that the drop in car theft has, to a very large extent, been driven by improved car security. And actually, Germany is a very interesting case because already in 1961, uh, Germany passed legislation on, on car security. Uh, they, they introduced uh, mandatory column locks in cars. And Germany was the first country where 
the level of car theft started to go down and to and to remain st or to remain stable. So where everywhere else, particularly in England, joyriding became became rampant uh, in the 60s and 70s. In in in, in Germany, it, it that never happened that boom, and that is most likely the result of this legislation on the mandatory column locks. Now, after that, many other countries have it induced uh, mandatory security for cars, not only the, the, the locks, but now there, is, there are electronic devices. Uh, the European Commission has introduced legislation in 1999 on car security. This has all been very carefully analyzed, and I, I, can, I can say that all the studies that I have seen, and that, that is about, about a dozen, show indeed that you can see that the drops in car theft uh, track new legislation on car security. So it's, it's for me very, very evident now that, that the, the drops in car theft have been security driven. Uh, and then I come to, uh, actually what I, what I also find very interesting, I come to that later. Then I, then I come to uh, another a very important crime besides car theft, household burglary. This, this, for a long time, used to be, apart from car theft, the type of crime that most heavily afflicted ordinary households in, uh, in Western societies. Uh, and obviously, this is also, this has not gone un unnoticed by the households. Uh, there has been a lot of awareness about the risks that your house will be burgled and people have started to, to invest. Uh, in, the, uh, in the ICVS, uh, we ask about two types of household security, and, we, and I'm very glad that we did. Uh, we, so we, we have a question about whether the household owns specialized uh, certified uh, locks, and the second question is whether the household owns uh, a burglar alarm. And this is uh, uh, a table which sums up uh, the comparison that I made between the level of security in 2004, the percentage of high-grade door locks, the percentage of households with burglar alarms, uh, and we, we ranked the countries on the level of security. There is not a perfect correlation between the two types of security, but in principle, you can see England and Wales and the Netherlands uh, and Canada have the highest level of household security, and Switzerland and Denmark are clearly uh, at the bottom. And there, there are also, it's not so obvious to explain, but certainly in Denmark, uh, uh, I can, uh, there, is, there, is, there is some documentation that you can really see that uh, also, the Danish Crime Prevention Council was always very skeptical about technical crime prevention. There was ideological resistance to make your nice Danish house into a fortress. The Danes simply didn't like that idea. And there is a bit of that also, of that ideology also in Switzerland. I immediately understand those uh, sentiments because we were exactly the same in the Netherlands in 1970. So I, I said also to the Swiss and the Danes, where I have also lectured in the past months, uh, you, you, were, you were just a little bit, uh, a little bit behind. You were, it, it, you were slow in reacting to the boom in crime. In, the, in, the, in, the, in my dynamics, uh, these countries are just slow responders compared to the, the Brits and the Dutch. Now, I, as I also explained this morning, in, in these countries, in England and Wales and in the Netherlands, situational crime prevention has been very, very actively promoted by the government, by local government, but also by central government. Uh, and that is something that has not happened in, in, uh, in some of these other countries. Now, if we look at the changes in the level of burglary, you see indeed that, that the, 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 the most secured countries, the countries with the most secured houses uh, have experienced the most significant drops in crime uh, and the, t the three countries that had invested much less in security uh, have not experienced a drop in burglary, they have actually uh, experienced a continued 
increase in the level uh, of burglaries. And this has now come to the point that, as you can see, Denmark really ha uh, has a level of victimization by burglary, which is ex extraordinary, it's exceptional. It's much, much higher than anywhere else on the European continent. And indeed, the country is now in crisis mood. It is the number one topic uh, in the newspapers uh, that, that the, the houses in, in, Den in Copenhagen, but also elsewhere in the country, are extremely um, much at risk for burglaries. Uh, and finally, now also, the fear of crime among the Danish public is indeed going up. It had, had always been very, uh, very low. Now, uh, I think uh, that with, 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 with these results, I have indeed provided uh, the beginning of empirical evidence that the levels of burglaries have indeed most probably been driven down ac across Western countries by investments of households promoted by the government or not in their own security. Uh, so it is, uh, I think, an interesting be beginning of evidence for the uh, validity of this dynamic model that I showed you uh, earlier on. And that is, uh, that is, I think, the main message uh, of my, uh, of my presentation, but there are a few things that I would like to add, uh, which, I, 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 which I think are theoretically important. Uh, the, first, the first one is that, uh, again, British colleagues, uh, Graeme Farrell and Maki Celoni and, and some others, they have uh, carried out a secondary analysis of the ICVS data. So they have also looked at, uh, with a multi-level uh, analysis, the, looked at the international drops in crime. And what is interesting is that they have also looked at the sequencing of the drops in crime. And they found, analyzing our data, that clearly the first type of crime that started to drop type were burglary and car theft. And then only other types of crime were still going up. Uh, this is true for other types of property crime, and it's certainly also true for assaults and threats, which only started to decline much, much later. Uh, and their interpretation is that particularly car theft, and I think Graham Farrell was the first to publish on that, that car theft uh, is a so-called so debut crime. They say uh, young, young, young boys at risk, showing deviant behavior, they start to experiment first, maybe with drugs, but also with joyriding. That is the first kind of real criminal act that they commit. Uh, and then uh, Graham Farrell uses this other concept of the stepping stone. He says the car, a successful car theft is a stepping stone for a, a more developed uh, career as a, as a juvenile delinquent. And I think. Household burglaries fit in very well, because if you look at the careers of, of people, uh, indeed, very early on in their careers, they committed joyriding, and then they do the first burglary in their own neighborhood. The, now, the idea of, 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 uh, of Celoni and Farrell is that if you close off, close off, if you close the doors on car theft and on household burglary by improved security, uh, you take away the opportunities to start a life of crime. If you block the debut crime, fewer people will start a criminal career. Uh, and not Graham and, and Maki, but I think it was Ron Clark with Webb. They also, in one of their articles, uh, very interestingly speculate a little bit about the crime trends in Germany. And they really say that it should be taken seriously, the, the possibility that the legislation of the, in the 1960s to improve security in cars has helped the Germans uh, to, 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 to keep control on the numbers of uh, offenders, juvenile offenders, who committed the debut crime of car theft. 
And that's why perhaps the crime boom in Germany has never been as pronounced as it has been in England and, 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 and the Netherlands. That is, that is not a proven theory, but it's an interesting, I think, uh, interesting extrapolation based on, the, on these theories about debut crimes uh, and uh, stepping stone, stepping stone crimes. Now, I know that still there is some ideological resistance to situational crime prevention. People think it is, it is too much uh, the economist view. It's, 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 it's in a way not heartwarming, the idea that when you protect your house better, crime goes down. It's not, it's not really uh, politically very attractive. Uh, what I want to point out is that promoting uh, household security is certainly not uh, politically neutral. And I want to, to, uh, to make that point uh, by showing you that uh, if the government does not intervene on the security market, what happens is that the middle classes who, have, who can afford to improve the security will indeed improve the security, and that is much more of a problem for the lower middle and for the lower class. Which means that my hypothesis is that the drop in crime might have profited most of all the middle class and the upper middle class, and much less so uh, the lower class. And I've looked in the ICVS data uh, to see whether that is correct, uh, and I've looked at the data from 12 Western countries, which uh, includes the United States of America. We see here trends in, uh, I think this is in burglar alarms. You see the, the, the upper class, the upper quartile people, you see an enormous jump in the level of households with a burglar alarm. You see that the, the lowest quarter, income quartile, you see that there is also an increase, but the, the gap in security has not narrowed down. Actually, the gap between the top quartile and the lowest quartile has, has increased. And then we look at the victimization rates for burglary. You see that there has been an enormous drop for the upper quartile. There has also been a, a, an even larger drop for the, the second uh, best income group. And you see hardly any improvement in the level of victimization of the, uh, the, the poorest 50% of the population. So what we actually have witnessed in Western countries is that crime has dropped, yes, overall in the country, but in particular among the middle class, and much less so uh, in the poor uh, regions, neighborhoods of the country. And if you, if you look at this per country, uh, statistically it became a bit tricky, so I've never published it, but you can, I, I can assure you that these differences were the most pronounced in the United States of America and much less in Europe. And this is also what you can expect, because in Europe, at least in some, some countries, the government has promoted, uh, as friends in the Netherlands, it's mandatory for all houses, so that uh, applies also to houses uh, in, so in, in housing estates. So in the Netherlands, the gap cannot have been become much bigger uh, as it has in the United States. So in conclusion, uh, about what I uh, have talked, I think that uh, <coughs> elementary home security, but also car security, any security, should be promoted by, by the government, and this is particularly a priority in Switzerland, Denmark, and Estonia, but also Germany can still, has still room to improve, I think. If they would apply the Dutch standards, they would still have a lot of work to do. Uh, this is in particularly important, I think, uh, when you focus these efforts on the most vulnerable groups across the EU, which is the lower quartile income group. That's where situational crime prevention can make even a bigger difference than in, in the middle class, because the level of victimization is higher. Uh, finally, I see that uh, in, in Germany, but also in the Netherlands, car theft is, is over the past three years, again going up a little bit. This is also true for household burglary. So clearly, perhaps, we are at the beginning of a new uh, crime epidemic. If we want to prevent a new crime epidemic, uh, I think a, a second generation set of security measures has to be 
invented, designed and, and implemented. And I see that as one of the big challenges uh, for, the go for Western governments at the time. And uh, sadly, in my own country, there is at the moment zero interest in crime prevention. Uh, we have a minister that any, any, any problem that you put before him uh, is solved by zero tolerance. That's his only, only, he has only one magical solution for all crime problems, zero tolerance, more severe punishment. So crime prevention is at the moment not politically very, uh, very, very popular, uh, unfortunately, in the Netherlands. But I think this is the way to go. And that for me, it's very uh, encouraging to see that in Germany, there is still such a big outpouring of, of people coming to the crime prevention day. If we organize a, a day like this, there, there may be uh, 20 people or 40. <laughs> Yeah, we will, we will not organize it because it's not worse. It's very sad in the Netherlands, but maybe uh, uh, there will be, there will be uh, a, new, a new opportunity for criminal opportunity countries in the, in the near future. Thank you. which I fully agree with. Um, Erwin Waller in his book, uh, Less Law, More Order, no, less, yes, Less Law, More Order, uh, shows the graphic of the crime statistics in New York City, FBI statistics. And he shows that, if you take the <coughs> graphic, he shows that the drop in crime started years before Giuliani came up with his zero tolerance politics. Now, in normal philosophy, uh, we assume that the cause is before the effect. In other words, it is rubbish. Thank you. I have a question to a special kind of um, um, criminal prevention um, techniques. Uh, what do we think about property marketing? Uh, property marking. <laughs> well, I have not recently uh, studied property marking. This was, this was uh, an important program two, 20, 30 years ago. Uh, I, I don't think that it, it was very successful. In, in the Netherlands, so it, 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 that, that's why it, 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 it was phased out. Where it's, fair, where it's very hot now is, is, uh, is, in, uh, is marking of uh, uh, car parts in the United States. That is, that is at, at the moment uh, a new frontier. And the research evidence is mixed, but it's certainly not negative. So perhaps uh, the marking of parts, particularly of expensive cars, is a is is a evidence-based crime prevention measure, but property market in general, uh, I have not seen very convincing evidence that it is, that it has helped. Um, Car Caroline Davy from the Design Against Crime Solution Centre, and um, we're interested in how you can keep interest in crime prevention. Um, at the moment when crime levels are dropping. Uh, one of the things that we particularly noticed is um, interest in uh, themes like resilience, for instance. And when you look at some of those approaches, then the focus is very much on uh, prevention of things like disasters. And obviously the difficulty with rare events, um, it's very difficult to develop an evidence base for that because there are not sufficient events to show that the things that you did had an effect. So I wonder what you would recommend. I, I, I agree that, that crime prevention in, uh, in many countries in, in needs a kind of rebranding. The, the, the concept of crime prevention itself is, uh, is dated in, uh, in, in, in Dutch culture. The journalists 
have a, get a, extremely bored if you if you raise the flag of crime prevention. Uh, as as here today in this conference, uh, anything that is related to to victims and victim protection uh, is is extremely popular now nowadays. That is something people can identify with, and I think the this idea to to associate crime prevention with victim protection and rights uh, is very clever. And that also Irvin Waller actually. Uh, has made that, that connection, and he's now publishing much more about victim protection than about crime prevention. So he has come to the same conclusion that maybe we, in this rebranding exercise, indeed the victim should, should be a centerpiece in our, in our programs and in our proposals. So that, that would be my, uh, my advice. Uh, preventing repeat victimization, for instance. Uh, makes a lot of sense and, and uh, is, is, is feasible and it's also politically uh, attractive. Yeah, my name is Nils Christie, so it's possible for me to talk later on, but uh, just a few points since I'm a Scandinavian. I have, of course, great affinity to the, an understanding for the Danish position. Yes. Not to create a society of distrust. It's a value in itself. And it is a value, I will touch on that uh, when I talk later, it's a value that uh, we, uh, in, uh, in my country, we are seen as some of the most naive, can we say that in English, uh, yes. people uh, among civilized nations. We trust our neighbors. It's so important to keep that naivete, that trust of other people, and find all ways of enforcing that, or to encourage that. And it's a dangerous, it's a little danger in some of the crime prevention activities that you know, we spread the opposite view, that most people are gangsters, and we have to protect our property to the utmost. I dislike strongly to lock my office door at the Institute of Criminology, I never do it. And uh, uh, I prefer to have that attitude to the students and uh, all those who are around there. Well, this was a little sort of value statement uh, from my side. Uh, and other little point that we just talked about last night, that is the interesting phenomena of um, young people not meeting at the street corner anymore. They sit at home with their data and communicate with other young people, which is of course a great blessing uh, in that meaning. That means that they are not uh, out in that corner close to the pub and now we have to fill the empty time with something. So uh, a good crime preventive uh, measure would be then to increase the use of uh, data among these uh, youngsters to subsidize those without. But then we have the other side of this. It's in so many ways in a society, in a functioning society, it's so good that people meet face to face. So um, to preserve uh, those values of meeting face to face, it might be right to say then we must accept there will be more crime in the streets. Yes, thank you, Niels. It, it reminds me of, uh, of what I experienced in Amsterdam in the 70s when we had uh, two American professors uh, in sociology uh, in, at the University of Amsterdam. And they closed their doors when they were going for a coffee. And we laughed and laughed. And said, they are completely paranoid. They are idiots. Nowadays, if you do not close your door at my university, the security guard will give you a reprimand you because it's mandatory. To close your doors. You can see the change in, in, in culture, uh, but I share the nostalgic feelings uh, that, that, that you have. That, yes, but I, I think uh, maybe, maybe we, we in Amsterdam live in a harsher reality. We, we really had to do something and to change our attitudes because uh, we had a, a real crime boom in the 70s and 80s. I think more than Norway or Denmark. Yes. Oh, sorry. Um, a question from my side. I'm from Austria. I would like to ask you, uh, do you see the same trend 
uh, car theft, for example, or burglaries, a decrease over the years uh, because we are close to the form of Iron uh, Curtain, to the former Eastern Europe countries. Do you see the same trend that there is a decrease in car thefts or burglaries over the years? Well, unfortunately, Austria is one of those countries that has only taken part once in my survey. I have invited them every time, but they were, they were not interested. So there is, there is, in my view, not, not that much reliable, real reliable information about Austria because it's all police recorded statistics. But I would assume there is certainly also a stabilization uh, of, of, of this. I am, I am aware that uh, also in Denmark, of course, uh, the, the phenomenon of the, the uh, traveling burglar from uh, East and Central Europe is very, is very much discussed, and this is also true uh, for the Netherlands. Uh, but, but if you think about uh, this, this new phenomenon with open borders, uh, with some countries that are much poorer, so there is, suppo there is almost inevitably some uh, importation of crime from these countries. If you, if you have the least secured houses, as the Danes have, they, of course, become the obvious target. And I was in, uh, in Denmark uh, last month for, for a lecture, and the police people there said they do not even bother to stop in Germany. They go straight to Denmark because they know the, the, the pickings are better there than in, in, in Germany. And the same is true for Switzerland. Uh, so there, I think the, uh, the Swiss and the Danes, in a way, attract problems from, from Eastern Europe by having underinvested in their uh, household security. Uh, and, but Austria, I, I would have to, uh, well, to, to study. Take Germany, for example. They are also in the same situation. Yes, but the level, the level of security is... Yes. The former Eastern German yeah. in car theft. Yes. Well, but, we, but the, the Netherlands and, and, uh, also has its, has, has this, this, certainly with car theft, we had many people coming uh, to uh, find cars in, in, in Holland and bring them back to Poland. Uh, but that, ha that has not uh, prevented the drop in, overall drop in, in car theft. Okay, thank you. We have, we have to close. Um, thanks for joining us. Thank you again for your speech. And See you in 30 minutes. I, I hope. Thank you. Thanks. 20 minutes.